will be found in verse 20. Hebrews 11 and verse 20. And the scripture says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. The title of the message this morning is The Blessing by Faith. The Blessing by Faith. Now, to get to this point, I want us to, to recap a little bit of what we have been studying concerning faith. And we have seen that all true faith in Christ endures. Endures. If you look back to chapter thir uh, uh, same chapter, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith. True faith endures to the end. And so does all who are quickened by the Holy Spirit and given life in faith in Christ. This faith is a gift of God. It is the power of God. It is the work of God in the, the, the believer's heart. He gives us this faith, and this faith, if it is genuine, will not go away. It will endure unto the end of this life. We will continue in the Word, in hearing, in obeying and worshiping God. And as we journey through this life, we are ever looking forward to the kingdom that is to come. This world to a believer is nothing but a barren world. It is an empty world. It is full of difficulties. It's full of troubles. It's full of trials and, and tears and sorrows. Therefore, for our joy, we do not look for any comfort here. Our comfort is in heaven. Our joy is there where Christ sits. And so the believer will endure, looking only to Christ. By faith, we endure. Now then, but as we journey through this world, we also know this, that we shall be tried. All true faith will be tested. You see, it's easy for someone to say, I believe in Jesus. That's easy. Any one of you can say that. But one thing is, God will test that faith. Not for himself, but rather for you. That you may know if your faith is real. That's the important thing. If your faith is not real, then what good is your faith? If it is not genuine faith, it is not anything to your soul. It's no, no value to you. And so I desire to know this. Is my faith real? when I come to death's door, when I enter into before the judgment bar of God, is my faith genuine or is it made up? And to do this, God tests. He tries. And that's what he see in verse 17. Abraham, he says, by faith Abraham when he was tried. So faith is tested. The psalmist said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So then, believer, let us see that the trial of our faith, though painful and grievous, though vexing to the flesh, it is precious. That's what Peter said. The trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. Why? Because it is to the praise and glory of Christ. That's what our faith is, to the praise and glory of Christ. Abraham was tried, and you remember he was tried, how? By offering up his only son, Isaac, whom he loved. His beloved son, the one in whom the promises was given. Yet Abraham did not flinch. He did not flinch at the command of God to offer his son. Why? Because he believed the promises of God. So then we see this, true faith True faith does not look at the outward circumstances. The grounds of our faith is not based in circumstance. It's not based in this world. Our faith is based on the Word of God. And the Word of God rules over all things. True faith does not look at the appearance but looks only to the promises of God. 
Abraham believed God and was faithful regardless of the circumstances. Therefore, he trusted the word of God that Isaac would surely be the one from whom Christ would come. Therefore, he was able to offer him up. Now, I ask you this, you who are believers, are you tried? And believe me, if you are not tried yet, you will be. Seems like that this life for the believer is nothing more than one wave of trial, one wave of difficulty after another. The believers are tried. Yet we are not looking to the arm of flesh to deliver us. We do not look to the arm of flesh to deliver us. We look to Christ. We look to Him. We know this, that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. In Christ. Now, now then we get to our text. So we see that faith endures and we see that faith is tried. Now then, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. Now, in these next three objects of faith, he's going to deal with Isaac with Jacob and with Joseph. And, and the first thing I want you to see is that the, to notice is that these men are not seen in their prime, but rather at their deathbed. It was at his deathbed that Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. It was at Jacob's deathbed that he blessed the children of Joseph. It was at Joseph's deathbed that he said, you need to, when you leave this place, take my bones. And so these men are seen at the end of their life. These saints, having endured all the trials of their course, have now come to the end. Yet, what do you see these saints doing? Are they looking back? No. They're looking forward. They're looking forward. Look at that. In our text, it said he blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. He was at his death. His life was over. This body was about to go to the ground. And yet these men were not looking back. They were looking forward. They were looking to the future. This is an aspect of true faith. True faith, even at death's door, looks forward. Not as this being an end, but rather being the beginning of the experience of all the promises of God. Our deathbed is a place that we should look as a point of leaping forward, leaping off into eternity to receive the true blessings that God has prepared for us in Christ. That's what these men were doing. They were looking forward. Looking to the future. How true it is that all the saints of God, that the death of the body is not the end, but rather the beginning. Paul said to depart and be with Christ is what? Far better. Far better. And so it is with all true faith. We, we have all the blessings of God bestowed upon us, but we have not yet experienced the fullness of them. We see yet through a glass darkly. But these men were looking forward to seeing Christ face to face. They were anticipating stepping off. Why? Because God was faithful. That's what they're... Their hope was in. God was faithful that Christ should come and deliver them from their sins. And now, I want us to narrow in, though I'm not looking at all three this morning, just looking at this one, Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, the blessing, the blessing. Now, before these two... Men spoken of here, Jacob and Esau, the ones who were to be blessed. Before the children were yet born, God declared this, 
that the elder shall serve the younger. That's the declaration of God about these two men in the womb of their mother, not yet being born. God said this, the younger one shall be blessed. The younger one shall be blessed over the older. That's God's declaration. If you go to Genesis chapter 25, you can see this for yourself. Genesis chapter 25. And you can, you can kind of stay over here in Genesis. We're going to see a lot of things out of this uh, account. So you can reign in this area in your Bible. Genesis 25 and look at verse 22. This is Rebecca. She's got these, uh, she's pregnant with these children and she's having a struggle. There's a struggle in her womb. These children are even fighting in her womb. And she says uh, in verse 23, And the Lord said unto her, Na Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And yet Isaac... Now, Isaac heard this. Isaac knew this to be the truth. And yet, we see this in verse 28. Look at this. As the children grew up, look what happened. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat the venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And so knowing this, the prophecy of God, he loved Esau. So when his life was soon to come to an end, with his whole heart he defied God. The blessing was to go to Jacob. God said that. And yet we come to the end of Isaac's life. You come to the, uh, chapter, look at chapter 27. And look at verse 1. He said, It came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said to him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, the weapons and the quiver and the bow and go out in the field and take some venison and make me a savory meat as such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat. Listen that my soul may bless thee before I die. See, Jacob believed the blessing. But he defied God in the object of the blessing. To bless Jacob over Esau was against all nat natural order and custom. It was always the custom of the men of this day to bless the elder son, not the younger. And also this, Jacob was not appealing to his father. He was not an appealing son. He was a mama's boy. He, he hung around the tents and he hung around his mama. Now, Esau was a man's man and Jacob and, and Isaac admired that about Esau. He was, he was a man's son and he was a, a skillful hunter and he loved that venison that he could hit, they could get that deer and cook a good stew and Jacob loved that. Yet though Isaac failed in his choice in a selfish desire to set Esau above Jacob, listen, I do not want to diminish this truth that Isaac truly believed the promise. Don't miss that. Isaac's faith in the promised blessing was not dim. He was mistaken in the object of his blessing, but he was no doubt a believer in the promise. And consider also Jacob and Rebekah in this story. They believed the promise. They believed the promise. They heard the word of God and believed the promise of God and knew this, that whosoever Isaac blessed, he would be the one that Christ should come from. They believed that promise, that this, this blessing had power. It had authority because it was from the word of God. They believed in the blessing. 
Yet the means by which they obtained it, the means by which they accomplished it was sinful. You remember how they obtained this. First of all, Jacob, he schemed. He schemed and was very cruel to his brother. His brother came to him hungry and starving, and what did he use? He used that in order to buy his birthright. He said, well, sell me your birthright and then I'll give you some stew. And you know, Esau didn't have any respect to the birthright. That's true enough. But how Jacob obtained it was sinful. It was wicked. And then how they obtained this blessing here in verse 27 is by deception. Rebecca is going to tell Jacob, She's going to hear about him wanting to bless Esau, and then what does she do? She sends him out to get some goats, and she makes a stew, and then she puts Esau's clothes on him and, and, and goat skins on his hands because Esau was a hairy man and Jacob was a smooth man. So in order to deceive their blind father, can you see how, how devious this is? The man was blind, and they walked in and deceived him to get the blessing was very deceptive. And this is a lesson for us. Believer in Christ, I want you to see the lesson. We who are believers in Christ are endowed with great and precious promises given to us by Christ. Promises that are not yet fulfilled. But let us not follow the example of these schemers to fulfill the promises of God. Consider this. Our Lord says to us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because we know this. God has an elect people. We know this. God chose a people. We know this. Christ came and redeemed those people. And the Spirit of God is now sent into the world to call those people to faith in Christ. But what is the means? What is the means by which God has chosen to save His people? It is the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is the chosen means that God has ordained to call His elect. And we know all these things that all time and providence are moving by the hand of God. We know this. We know it. We know all circumstance and events are moving toward this thing that God should call His people and gather them in. I remember a story of a man, a believer, a friend of mine. He was a businessman, very successful, and he was in a, a strange city, and he was just walking around the city. Had no clue what he was doing out that day on a Sunday, walking around, and he looks up and he sees a sign, a church sign. He just says, oh, well, I guess I'll just go in here. And a man preached the gospel to him, and the Lord saved him. Now, what was God doing with all that time in providence? He was leading that man to hear the gospel and saved him. We know this. Yet when the times are lean, when few believe on Christ, in these times... We in zeal and sincerity believe the promises of God, yet we are tempted to use deception to bring men in. It's a temptation, isn't it? Don't think it's not a temptation to us. Well, let's, let's just get some fancy music and let's get some programs going and maybe we can get people in here so that they can hear the gospel. See, we got good intentions, but what are we doing? We are scheming. That's not for us. And I tell you, it won't work out well. It didn't work out well for Jacob and his mother. They, were, they, had, they had to deal with, some, with much suffering because of their scheming. God didn't excuse their sin. And so we're not to do, we're not to use the wisdom of the world to fulfill the promises of Christ. What are we to do? Preach the word. What are you to do? Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort all long suffering. You see, we're not of the world. And we should not scheme with the world. 
we should preach the gospel. And who does the saving? Who does the calling? Who does the bringing in? God does. God does. So we should use every opportunity available to us, but not with an idea to trick men into coming. We don't do that. And also we should learn from Isaac's mistake. Isaac believed the promise, and yet he willfully desired to give the promises to the wrong person. I know this, sometimes we have family members and friends that we really love dearly. And then we know that their gospel, that their Christ is not the Christ. We understand that we are worshiping two different gods. And yet our affection overrules and we, we give their gospel some credibility. I know we're tempted with our children. We love our children. Our children come to us and say, I'm scared. I'm fearful of hell. And what do we want to say? It'll be all right. Well, that's foolish. How do I know it'd be all right? If they don't believe in Christ, it won't be all right. If they don't come to Christ for refuge, it won't be well with them. We should not try to bestow the blessings of the elect upon those that do not believe. We cannot. It's injustice. It's cruelty to do that. We shouldn't do that. So we can learn these things from this text. But there's greater things to learn here in this blessing. Greater things to learn. And this is what the Holy Spirit I know would have us learn from this blessing of Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed concerning things that are to come. Now, the whole intention of this by God is to picture the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole of this blessing, this whole story, is to picture the gospel. First of all, the first aspect this blessing pictures is the election of God. The promise of God was from the beginning that Christ should come. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. How? And he shall bruise his heel. By his crucifixion, by his death, he, by his offering, he should wash our sins and cover our nakedness before God. That's the promise. But to whom is this salvation purposed? This salvation was not a random chance. God did not purpose salvation to be a roll of the dice. To whom was this salvation purposed? Whom, to whom did God purpose that Christ should come and die? Well, this is clearly seen in our example, in this story of Jacob and Esau. Remember back in 25, we just read that in chapter Genesis 25. He says, These two nations that are in thy womb are two manner of people, shall be separated from thy bowels, the one stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Before these sons of Isaac were born, you pay close attention, God chose one of them and passed by the other. God chose one. God loved one. And God hated the other. He chose Jacob to receive all of the blessings. He chose Jacob to be the head of his mother's sons. He chose Jacob that all should bow down before him. And this was fulfilled, we know historically, by those two nations, Israel and Edom. Edom is no longer there. It's gone. Who's left? Israel was left. So that was fulfilled historically. But there's something greater here than, histor than a historical fulfillment. This is a picture not of a physical nation, but rather a spiritual people. A spiritual people. 
The church is pictured here by Jacob. Jacob is a picture of the church. It is all saints and believers in Christ. This is what Paul calls the remnant according to the election of grace. So just as God chose Jacob and passed by Esau, even so God chose a people that he should receive the blessings of God, a people that he would save by the coming and dying and resurrection of his own son. This point of doctrine is no fable, no imagination of man, but it is plainly revealed in the Word of God. I'm not doing this to be intellectual. I'm doing this to show you this is the truth. This is the Word of God. Go to Romans chapter 9. This is very plainly described for us in Romans chapter 9. Look at verse 6. Paul, after telling about the Israelites, that nation, he said they had so many blessings. They got the prophets. They got the law. They had God speaking to them and, and, and through the prophets. But yet they're not all saved, Paul. How can they be God's people if they're not all saved? Is the word of God fallen to the ground? Look at verse 6. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Four. This is why they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because are they the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And he, that is, now he's explaining it. That is, this is the meaning. They which are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Well, this is the word of promise that at a time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah hath conceived even by one our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but him that calleth. It is said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now what we just read, the elder shall serve the younger. What is God teaching? Election. Election. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? See, God, he, Paul has already got your argument. You, the argument of man is this. Well, that's just not fair. Is there unrighteousness with God because he loved one and hated the other because he chose one and not the other before they had done anything? Is that unrighteous? He said, God forbid. For he already told you this, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The promise of God was given to Rebekah and that was Jacob, that he should be blessed, that he was the chosen one. Why? As a type to show that the election standeth sure. That God has from eternity loved a people that his choice was not based on their works of what they have done or should ever do to merit this. But according to his own free grace, his own free love, he purposed to bless them. with all spiritual blessings. In Ephesians chapter 1 it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, to himself. You see, all these blessings, this blessing of Isaac is a typical blessing. It is a, it is a spiritual blessing. God hath blessed us. Who? All that he chose in Christ before the world began. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And 
And listen, no matter the schemes of men, no matter the, the situation or circumstances of time, this is sure. As sure as Jacob received the blessing from Isaac, you mark this down, all the elect shall be blessed by God. All of them. And nothing will stop it. Though we, like Isaac, may be mistaken as to who they are. Now, I'll tell you this. I look out here, and I can only... I, can, I take you at your word. So you tell me you believe in Christ. I can only see so much. I don't know. I'm usually mistaken. So, who this blessing belongs to, I know this. It belongs to all who are in Christ. To all who believe in Christ. I know that. Though we may be mistaken, though we like Rebecca and Jacob may fail and sin, God will use all people, events, and circumstances of time to bring his chosen to salvation. All things, all things move by the sovereign hand of God and he overrules to bless his people. Secondly, the blessing of salvation is by Christ. Now then look at your, look at back at uh, Genesis here. Look back at Genesis. And look at verse, uh, chapter 27 and verse 2. Now, Isaac is going to try to bless Esau here. He doesn't know what he's doing, but God is using this to preach the gospel to us. Look at this. And he said, Behold, now I am old. And I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons and quiver and a bow and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me a savory meat that I love and bring it to me that I may eat and that my soul may bless thee and die. See here the overwhelming purpose of God is to show forth the gospel here. Listen, before Jacob would bless Esau, he must first kill the animal, and make the stew. Before the blessing of God can be given, an offering must be made. An offering must be made. Because of the sin of Adam, because we were all born in sin, dead in trespasses and sin because none is good, none is righteous by nature. How then does a sinner obtain the blessing of God? By an offering. An offering must be made. A sacrifice must be offered to please the justice of God before the blessing can be given. Esau, he's a picture of all reprobate men. You see, he went out to make the stew of his own hands, right? He was a skillful hunter. He used his own skill, and he made an offering of his own making. And what was the result? He was not blessed with spiritual blessings. And so it is with all who try to bring in your works to God. If you bring in your offerings, your offerings are not acceptable. You will not be blessed. But I want you to see this. Jacob, he's going to bring in an offering that is not made by his own hands. Look at that. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son, and Esau went in the field to hunt venison and bring it. And Rebekah spake to Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speaking to Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me the venison and make me a savory meat, and I will eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me thence two good kids of goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. See, Jacob is going to bring an offering, but not his own. This is the doctrine of substitution. 
that by the offering and work of another, Jacob was to please his father and receive the blessing. The goat here pictures Christ. The goat here pictures Christ as taken from among the flock. What is that but Christ taken from among human, from among men? He came into this world as a man. He condescended to become a man so that he might offer himself to God in our stead. And being the offering for sin in his flesh, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, God made all of the sins of His elect to meet in the body of Christ. And then when God saw our sin in His Son, He exacted justice. He poured out vengeance upon His Son in the stead of His people. Look at what... Uh, Let me see this. Uh, look at what Rebecca uh, said. Uh, Jacob said this, My father peradventure will feel me. He said, I'm a smooth man and Esau's a hairy man. My father peradventure feel me. And I shall seem to be as him a deceiver and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said this, Listen, upon me be thy curse, my son. Is that not prophetic? That's what happened when Christ bore our sins. He said, upon me be the curse, my son. And that's what happened on the cross. He bore our sins. But not only this. He bore our sins. He satisfied the justice of God by his offering. Listen, if you ever desire to be accepted of God, you must have a savory meat. You must have an offering. Not your own. Only one offering can satisfy the offering of Jesus Christ. And secondly, this was not enough. Not only did Jacob need to bring an offering, but he himself must have become Esau. <laughs> he said, look, if I go into this tent, my dad's going to know I'm not Esau. He's going to feel me and know that I'm not Esau. Isn't that true? That if you go to God and you go to God in yourself, do you think you would have a standing before God? No. To be accepted of God, listen, we must become the Son of God. Now, the Son of God is the only one God is well pleased with. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But seeing we like Jacob are sinners, we cannot by any means become the sons of God in ourselves, who is holy and righteous and eternally loved. Behold then the cause of the two goats. Have you ever wondered why she said, get me two goats? One goat was to make the savory stew. The other goat was for this purpose, that she would take the skin and lay it all over him, his hands and his neck. And she would take the robe of Esau and cover him in it. Do you not see that this is what happens with Christ and his righteousness? When a man comes to faith in Christ, when we become a believer in Christ by the grace of God, this is what happens, is we become, we are robed in his righteousness. So much so that we are in union with Christ. This is how we're accepted. Because we are in union with him. Therefore, when Jacob came in there with those clothes and stuff, his father, he was confused. He heard Jacob's voice. But he tasted the stew, and man, that was it. He felt his hands, and he says, well, man, he feels like Esau. He grabbed him and brought him in, and he took a sniff, and he said, man, he smells like Esau. This must be Esau. And what did he do? He blessed him. What is it when we come in to, Christ, into God 
by faith in Christ. We come in the very skin of the Son of God. <laughs> we come in the very skin of our Savior so that when God sees us, He sees Christ. When God feels us, He feels Christ. When God smells us, He smells Christ. When God tastes the savoriness of righteousness, He tastes the righteousness of Christ. We have no righteousness of our own, but all our righteousnesses are in Christ. Even so, believer, then let us rejoice in this blessing. For we who are born again of the Holy Spirit are given even the very nature of Christ. So that when God searches for our sin, He finds none. In that day shall the iniquity of Israel be sought for and shall not be found. The transgression of Jacob shall be looked for and there shall be none. And notice it is Jacob's voice that he hears. What is this speaking to? This speaks to the duality of our natures now. Though we have, are in union with Christ, yet it's our voice he hears. <laughs> Isn't that something? Our voice he hears. And accepts us. He receives us. As he does his own son. And so then, let us come near to God. Let us be comforted in this. For Paul says, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. A sweet savor of Christ. Have you come to Christ? Have you come to Christ? Listen to the word of God. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Look, there is no other righteousness God will accept. There is no other offering God will accept but Christ. And except you come to God in Christ, you will receive the blessing of Esau, which is nothing but temporal and vanishing blessings. But if you come in Christ, you receive the blessing of Jacob, which is an eternal blessing, a spiritual blessing. All spiritual blessings in Christ. So by faith, Jacob blessed, uh, Isaac blessed Jacob. Because this blessing is a picture of the gospel. Which, which Isaac believed. Which we believe. Now he did bless Esau. But again, those blessings he gave Esau were only temporal. Now, you've had blessings, haven't you? All of you. You've had blessings. This morning, you woke up. I have a blessing. You, got, you have food. Blessings. What are they? Temporal. But we who believe have something greater. We have spiritual blessings of God. And I pray that God will bless this to your hearts.